All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, we've got Frank Seiler from Kansas City, and he's going to talk to us about copyright. Please give him a warm welcome. Good morning. Well, when we're all done, we get lunch, so it works, right? So um, please follow me on Twitter or call or text anytime if you have any questions. Of course, I'll be around for the rest of the conference if you have any questions afterwards. Um, with me being a lawyer, the first thing, of course, is a disclaimer. So, yeah, I'm a lawyer. I'm not your lawyer. In fact, I could get in trouble if I gave you legal advice out here. So, anyway, um, these slides are licensed Creative Commons. And let's get into copyright. So why should you care about copyright? Well, copyright governs everything that happens in software. And for that matter, a lot of things that are not software, things like uh, social media, YouTube, other places where you're gonna share any kind of media that you've developed. That is, anything that's in a fixed medium, which we'll talk about in a little bit here. So among other things, if you're writing open source software, you need to think twice about how you license your software and also what code you absorb into your software because that affects your rights and also the rights of other people who may want to use your software. Um, so in particular in the open source community we have some popular licenses that require you to distribute the source code of whatever you're working on. So that's important. Also we're talking about a big money kind of game here. Um, there's a TED talk called the $8 billion iPod. Um, and part of that is uh, you can get sued for $150,000 for every infringement. Now infringement is not just copying a song, for example, but it's also defeating the decryption on a DVD or a Blu-ray or something like that. You can be sued for all kinds of things. And so, especially if you're developing open software that you want others to use and not get in trouble for, you need to be thinking about how you want to structure your licensing agreement. Okay, what I'm not gonna talk about here, um, patents. There are many flavors as discussed in the session before this, there are design patents, utility patents. We're not gonna talk too much about those. Trademarks, trade secrets, um, those are other forms of what is sloppily called intellectual property. And so, those are important considerations, especially if you're developing a proprietary product, but we're not gonna to talk too much about those. Um, contract law comes into this as well, because frequently you'll buy software, and you know it'll say, well, if you open this CD or you open this box, you're agreeing to the terms of our license agreement. So that's actually can be a contract issue as well as a copyright issue, but we're not gonna spend any time on the contract part of that. Um, and cat videos, well, you're on your own there. Um, <clears throat> So, whenever you have law, we have this notion of jurisdiction. So, the internet, as you might know, is really a place without borders. Um, however, for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to assume sort of a North American-centric view, but the nice thing about copyright law is that it's actually pretty well established across borders as being fairly consistent. That's because copyright law is based on a bunch of international treaties. So. The good news is within the United States, consistent. All 50 states and the territories follow the same rules. It also means that basically Canada and the other places in the world follow the same rules. However, enforcement can vary quite a bit from place to place. Uh, you've probably heard of, you know, the Chinese have gone from basically not enforcing copyright law at all to actually being a fairly strong place in a lot of places, in a lot of ways. So um, now the caveat to that is some forms of intellectual property, like trade secrets, for example, are state, very state to state in the United States. They aren't regulated federally. So you have to be a little bit careful. Uh, what is copyright? Um, copyright's federal law. So that means um, that the Congress gets together and they decide what they think the rules should be. Uh, copyright law is one of relatively few things that's actually spelled out in the Constitution that says Congress has this power. Um, and not only does Congress have the power, but the courts have the authority and do regularly comment on what they think is enforceable, what they don't think is enforceable, whether they think a given term limit is a good idea or, um, or legal or not. And in fact, um, the, the system that we have is pretty well blessed by the courts. So. What you have is, is there are certainly parts of copyright law that are unclear and we don't really know what's enforceable and what's not. 
there are other parts that are very well settled. So it, it's important to sort of get a view of not only what, what the rules are, but which ones are very well settled and which ones are not. Okay, so what do you need to have a copyright? Well, it's really simple. All you have to do is write something down, take a video clip, uh, make a slide deck on your computer, write some source code, any of those things. Um, you can even, um, even buildings qualify. So if you design some kind of building, you can, um, you can have a copyright on that. Um, there are two important requirements that you should know about. One is that it has to be some kind of sort of artistic or creative at work. So um, you can't, for example, copyright the entries in a phone book because there's no creative aspect to that. They're simply listing names A through Z in most cases. If you were to impart a more interesting organization structure, you could probably copyright it. The second thing that's really important is that the work must be in a fixed medium. So the words I'm speaking right now are not subject to copyright. However, the videotape that's being taken is subject to copyright. And also the slides that I've created here, those are subject to copyright law. One important thing to note also is that when you create a work, there's no requirement that you stamp copyright on it, that you date it, that you put your name on it, anything like that. Copyright law is assumed to apply immediately. So unless, the, one thing about this is, if you go to, say, GitHub, you know, you don't have to know who wrote it, you don't have to know who, when they made it, all you have to know is that it's up on GitHub and therefore someone can claim copyright on it, even if they haven't put any kind of license agreement on there. So it's really important to think about what you're going to pull off GitHub, what you're going to pull off Stack Exchange or, or one of those other sites, Experts Exchange, and, and see, um, you know, if you, especially if you're looking for help on a problem with a commercial product, you should be very careful about lifting code off those sites because someone can have a copyright claim. There's no requirement that they've put any kind of copyright declaration in it. Um, one important thing to note also is that the statutes, the, so the actual laws passed by Congress, have built into them certain exemptions. So even though, uh, let's say that you're taking notes right now and you don't want, um, well, that's not a terribly good example, but let's, uh, the, the copyright statute actually has built into it certain things that are allowed by default. So for example, if you're Microsoft, you distribute a DVD of Windows 7. Um, the copyright statutes actually say that users can make a copy of those for backup purposes. So, and you can't restrict that, at least using the copyright law, because the statute actually says you have this right as someone who's purchased software. So you have to be careful with that. Um, you know, the, there are certain things that are going to be allowed by the statute, whether or not you want them to be allowed. Um, okay, so we've talked about what is a copyright. It's some kind of creative work presented in a fixed medium and there's no requirement for registration. So how do you let others use your stuff? Well, you give them a license. So what's a license? Uh, most generally, you think of a license as, as permission to do something. So you might have a driver's license, you might have an amateur radio license, a medical license. Any of those are simply permission or authority from the state to do a certain thing and not get in trouble for it. Um, copyright licenses are a little bit different in the sense that they, they don't confer any real authority. All they are are promises not to sue. So you buy a copy of Windows, Microsoft says you can install this on two PCs, and we won't sue you. It's basically how it works. Um, there are, however, elements of contract law that can attach when you buy something. So you have to be, it's not well tested where the boundaries are as far as what's copyright law, what's contract law. And the, the reason it matters is because for example, Microsoft might say, oh, we don't want you to reverse engineer this software. That's not protected by the copyright law, but they might have you on a contract claim. Um, by default, when you create a work, it is restrictively licensed. That is, you don't have to do anything to keep something private. You don't have to say all rights reserved or anything like that. That's simply the default. So if you want to open license something, you should place some kind of prominent license in it, whether it's in a source file, in a license file, on your GitHub account, whatever. But you need to declare some kind of open license if uh, you are interested in distributing things and doing it the right way. 
Um, I talked a little bit about shrink wrap agreements a moment ago where in a closed agreement, someone will try to restrict you further from doing things beyond what the copyright law uh, contemplates. So um, also, even, even a place you think of as open, like you go to the New York Times and you read an article, um, it's true that they will let you email that article out, but you don't own the content just by virtue of having emailed it somewhere. So remember that the New York Times still owns that content, so they are simply allowing you to look at it. So it's important to remember that viewing something or being able to access something doesn't mean that you have any kind of ownership claim in it. Okay, so because things are restrictively licensed by default, um, you should just assume that everything, all the fruit in the forest is poisonous. So unless you see some kind of indication that someone's placed a license file, someone's opened up their GitHub account, someone's said on their website, I'm giving this away, just be very careful about what you download and what you use. Um, this is particularly important because of something called viral licensing, which we're going to talk about here a little more in depth. Uh, fair use. This is another area that the statute says, okay, so copyright holder, you wrote some software, you sold it in a store, um, but there are still certain things that people are allowed to do because of public policy. So for example, um, if you got some, you got Microsoft Office and you wanted to write a review on it, Microsoft can't say, oh, well, you can't put any screenshots of our stuff there. I mean, that's, that's a public use, right? That's newsworthy. So there are certain things that you definitely can do regardless of what the copyright restrictions are. And the thing of it is, though, is that these are questions of fact. So if you get sued over them, ultimately, you know, they may go before a jury and the jury is going to have to sort out what is a copyright, what's fair use, and all these other things. So you may want to be fairly conservative in what you, you know, if you're really going to go to bat against a big, powerful entity, you want to be careful about how you use things. So, but it's pretty well established law that writing an article about something or uh, describing it on a blog, that sort of thing, um, are clearly okay within the meaning of fair use. So um, it's also important to know that personal use is okay. So for example, um, I said earlier that buildings can be protected with copyright law. So one thing you are definitely allowed to do is, at least if you're on a public street, is take a picture of a building and use it, you know, if you, if you want to take a picture of the Sears Tower and hang it up in your living room, that's perfectly okay. That's personal use. Um, there might be an issue if you took it and tried to sell it though. So, you know, there, there are some kind of interesting wiggle areas in the law where, okay, is it personal use, is it not personal use? The fact that you took it on a public street, does that play into it? Some of these issues are not well tested. Um, so I want to get into open licensing a little bit. And a little bit of history is probably helpful to understand the climate under which these things happen. So AT&T developed Unix back in the day. And they, they distributed it with all the compilers and development tools that you needed to do crazy things. And as you might imagine, when you hand these out to a bunch of engineering whiz students at Berkeley and MIT and elsewhere, you get some interesting developments on your operating system. And at Berkeley, it got to the point there was only about 1% of the AT&T code remaining in, their, in the code base. So, Berkeley decided, oh, well, we can distribute the 99% that AT&T doesn't own, and they did. Somebody filled in the one remaining percent, and we have BSD Unix. So, and on the other coast, you had Richard Stallman, uh, famously the creator of Emacs, and he um, put together a big set of tools, not just Emacs, but also the core utilities that we use on most Linux distributions, and he developed a license because he said, okay, not only do I want this stuff to be free, but I want it to stay free. So, for example, if, uh, if another company were to come along and want to adapt my software, I want all their changes to be available to the public as well. So you have kind of an interesting mix here of on the, in, in California here, we had a very open system. We had Berkeley Unix that you could download and you could basically do whatever you wanted with it. 
And on the East Coast, you have some guy developing Emacs and saying, well, not only do I want this to be free for what I've developed, but if you work on it, you have to distribute the changes. Um, <clears throat> so there are two different types to, well, two major categories of open source licensing. Uh, one is non-viral. Um, this is probably the easier one to work with if you're interested in uh, distributing software yourself. The Python license is an example of a non-viral license. So the nice thing about this is you can, you can just write your code and put it up on the internet and you really don't have to worry too much about how you distribute it. The one thing you do have to be careful of is where you get the source that goes into it. Um, so viral licenses. So the important thing about these is that when you use them, they contaminate any related code, any code that could be called a, what we call a derivative work. So for example, if you start with Linux and you develop um, a, new, a new graphics driver for Linux and you want to distribute that graphics driver with a product, well, not only, you, you can distribute the, the graphics driver with your product, but you must also distribute the source for that driver. So this has come, come up, uh, Linksys distributed a number of routers that had modified kernel code and they had to distribute the Linux kernel code as well as their patches to it uh, in order to comply with the GPL. Um, there are a couple other variants on the GPL. There's the LGPL, which is the library or lesser GPL. It's a little bit less restrictive, um, but still relatively obnoxious from a compliance point of view. Um, and there's also the AGPL, which is designed to deal with the fact that most software these days doesn't get distributed. So if you have a website, for example, you aren't actually distributing the server code. So the AGPL sort of is designed to give some wiggle room, I think, to license holders. It's got some sort of bizarre requirements in it. So just be careful if you come across, um, particularly the AGPL. The GPL is very common. It's used for the Linux kernel. It's used for Emacs and the core utils and pretty much everything else you get off GNU.org. Um, <clears throat> now, the one thing to note about viral licensing is it only works because copyright law is really strong. So it wouldn't be possible to write uh, such an onerously free license that requires you to distribute these things if copyright law was not so strong. So it, it's a very interesting hack on the copyright law to, th to contemplate that Stallman said, oh, not only are we gonna ask people um, to, uh, <clears throat> if you're gonna share your source, you've gotta distribute your source code. That's really only possible because the statutes are so strong and so uh, weighted towards the rights of the creators. Um, one important thing to note also, derivative works. So you, you take a copy of the Linux kernel and you develop some patch on it. it. It's a derivative work. So what that means is that it's gonna inherit the license of the parent basically. So, and the, the person who wrote the original is gonna have rights in the derivative work. So something to bear in mind, particularly for things that are virally licensed, is that you should be careful about developing a plugin or a kernel module or something to that effect, because you may, you may find yourself in a situation where you're gonna inherit the licensing of the parent. Uh, one interesting trend these days, I think, is the um, open hardware that's come up. I mean, Ibn Upton was here, and so, we're in a situation where not only are we talking about software these days as being something you can just download and run, but also hardware. And the same thing will come up with uh, the 3D printing, I think. So Arduino is an interesting one because you can download all the Gerbers and diagrams and everything, but they maintain a trademark on the logo. So they only want certain things to be labeled Arduino, even though they've opened up all their hardware. So theoretically, you could build one of these in your garage if you wanted to. Um, but you can't necessarily call it an Arduino unless it meets their approval. Um, one other trend I think that's helping because some of these licenses have gotten pretty unwieldy is we have these um, nifty graphical representations of logos. Uh, the Creative Commons also has a nice graphical representation that you can use. So if you want to put some slides up on the internet or you want to release some hardware or otherwise present some things to the public, these sorts of graphical licenses are very handy to remind people of how you intend them to be used. Um, one thing about the open hardware in particular is that these non there are licenses that say, oh, well, you can use this, but you can't use it for a commercial purpose. Well, the problem with that from a hardware perspective is that 
If you're trying to build a $35 computer, as in the case of the Raspberry Pi, someone somewhere is going to have to make some money. I mean, you're going to have to buy chips, and you're going to have to you know, pay for a PCB to be manufactured, and all these sorts of things. So these non-commercial clauses haven't been tested in court, to my knowledge. Um, and it's very sort of nebulous. What's the definition of non-commercial? You know, if it's a not-for-profit, does that mean it's non-commercial? I mean, you, you've, it's not well settled. So be careful if you include a non-commercial clause. You note that I'm not practicing what I preach because I licensed this slide deck as non-commercial. But uh, just be aware that non-commercial clauses, especially with respect to hardware, can be quite problematic. Um, OK. so. You're developing some software and you'd like to release it to the public under some kind of open scheme. What do you want to use? There are a lot of acronyms flowing around. How do you choose one? Well, one way to do it is simply to choose one of a project that you think that their distribution model would work for you. So you could choose the GPL or you could choose uh, the MIT or BSD license or you could use the Python license if you wanted to. Um, if you want something to be open source, I would say the best way to do it is to visit the open source initiative site, opensource.org. They're based in Palo Alto, um, so they're very close. And um, you'll find there a list of licenses that they consider to be open. And I think it's a good place to start. So, you know, give it, give it a thought and just be careful if you're going to download something off the internet. So, anyway, I'm done. Does anyone have any questions? Hi. Um, I have a question. Uh, so as a programmer, um, what is a programmer's uh, copyright, I guess, entitlement to uh, what you're creating uh, versus the employer if there are no specific contracts in place? So what do I put on that copyright? Do I put my name? Do I put my employer's? Do I put both? And what does that mean? So the... Um this is a great question, and the reason I didn't address it in the talk is because it varies quite a bit. Um, if you don't have, the, the default rule is generally that if you're doing a work and you're doing it, you know, sort of on company time at your desk at the office, then it's considered a work for hire. However, the specifics of the situation are going to determine what the outcome is. So typically I would say in that case, if you're sitting at your employer's desk, doing what the employer asked you to do, you would put the employer's name as the creator. Okay, and then so if I then attached a license to that work, is that license null and void because I don't actually have the copyright? It's, it's a question of fact. <laughs> so there's, there's no bright line rule there. So I, I mean the best thing would be to get some clarification and get a written, you know, get some written guidelines from your, from your firm as far as what they want you to do. Okay, and just one more quick question. In the case of mixed uh, copyright, so if I get an MIT licensed uh, piece of software, I make a bunch of changes to it and start applying GPL to it, uh, what is the result of that and can I do that? Um, th there are certainly multiply licensed projects out there. Um, as far as I know, they ha the, there hasn't been any extensive litigation on any of these. And so the answer is we don't really know what would happen. I think it's a question of facts. And you know, if you threw it before a jury, they'd try to sort it out. Um, so, but these things are very expensive to litigate. So I, I don't know if we'll ever get to that point. I, I, the safer course of action is to choose one license, I think. Um, so, you know, it's, and it's up to you to determine, you know, okay, if it's a choice between a more restrictive and a less restrictive license, which direction do I want to go? But there certainly are projects that are multiply licensed. Thank you. Uh, so my question was on, uh, so I'm a consultant. I use a lot of third party projects constantly for new people. Um, and I was wondering what are the, first of all, are there any sort of like red flag licenses that you should always avoid? And two, if a open source software project infringes on another license and you use that project, um, are you liable for that infringement? Uh, well, <laughs> the answer to the second question is maybe. <laughs> the answer to the first question is, uh, are there any red flag licenses? 
I would have to say it really depends on, on what exactly you're being asked to do. Um, so for example, if, if someone handed you uh, Microsoft Word and said, hey, I want you to find all the valuable parts and I want to sell them, you would probably say, well, I don't think that's such a great idea, right? Um, on the other hand, if somebody gives you, um, and by the way, the same thing goes for engineering a dead, uh, reverse engineering a dead product, is be careful about, you know, if you get software that's 25 years old and somebody says, hey, we, we really need this for our production, you know, you, you have to be careful about who the copyright owner might be. Um, so so I, w I would say that if you see something that looks funny to you, uh, you know, get, get a second opinion. That, that's the best advice I can give, whether it's on copyright law or on some other topic. Does that help? Yeah, that's helpful. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. <coughs> I think we've got time for one or two more and I'll see the rest of you afterwards, all right? Okay. Uh, I have two questions. Um, you mentioned earlier that to have copyright law apply, you need to have something that's in a fixed medium. Mm -hmm. Your talk, for example, your speech wouldn't uh, be covered by this. What if someone in this talk took notes on your talk? That's Would that be your cop copyright? No, no. Would that the be their co copyright? Copyright law is to the creator. So even if, so if they wrote it down, but you're the one inventing the speech and they put no creative work into it, they just copied what you were saying, what would happen then? Well, you could argue whether it's a derivative work or not. But you said that your speech was not copyright protected in the first place, so it can't be a derivative work. Well, the, the words that I'm speaking, because they're not in a fixed medium, yeah. do not qualify for copyright protection. Uh -huh. However, if you were to write something down, that would qualify for copyright protection. Right. So if you were, um, <clears throat> if I was reading from a script and you took notes word for word for what I said, uh -huh. then you could argue whether that person's written down copy is a derivative work or not. Okay. And if you wrote down my slides word for word, you could argue whether that's a derivative okay, work Okay, but not. it wouldn't apply if you just made a speech from memory. That's or, correct. Okay, all right. That's correct. Uh, my, so I, I do have uh, one quick question um, on shrink wrap licenses that you mentioned earlier. Um, do those tend to be valid? And if so, who do they apply to? For example, if I open a CD and then give it to my friend, he, right. didn't, he didn't do the opening of the CD. He didn't never agree to that shrink-wrapped agreement. Does it also cover him? That's, that's exactly right. And th that's why you're seeing a transition from shrink-wrapped licenses to click-through licenses. Um, oftentimes, these days, even every time you start a program under a new user account, you'll see, do you accept the terms of the license agreement? Okay. So what they're trying to do is get more and more people to sign off that, okay, yes, I agree to the license terms. As to whether they're valid or not, as far as I know, it's an open question. Okay. All right. Uh, in general, if it's a copyright term, then yes, the copyright law would apply. If it's a more contractual term, then it depends on the on the facts of the of the individual case. Okay. Thank so, you. So, so it's it's not a completely well established uh, system. Okay. So while I, while I know that uh, the uh, Python community is more of a permissively licensed uh, community as far as number of projects versus copyleft, I was a little bit surprised at how much you denigrated copyleft licenses, saying they were onerous, they contaminate your work, and so forth. I, I'm just curious of your view. If, are you, do you actually think copyleft is worse than proprietary licenses that say all rights reserved, you can't do anything? Uh, for example, your non-commercial example, the copyleft licenses are commercial and allow you to do commercial activity. Yet, yet you seemed harder on copyleft than even non-commercial ones. So yeah, I apologize if my characterization seemed to be denigration. Um, oh, it sort of so, sounded like it. <laughs> um, so it's absolutely true that copyleft is more free uh, in terms of what society has access to than a typical commercial license. However, it is also true that from a, if you're creating software, that the open source, that the GPL is difficult, I think, to deal with because if I want to write a module and I don't want to distribute the source, then you know I, I'm kind of stuck as far as my options if I want to, say, develop a proprietary Linux kernel module or something like that. So um, I, I, th I think the GPL is, is a great license and it's uh, certainly a number of useful projects have been contributed under the GPL, but I think you should be careful with it as a software developer. That's all the time we have. Please join me and welcome Frank. Thanks, Frank. <laughs>